Hello, and welcome to episode 514 of the official EstablishTheRun.com podcast. My name is Adam Levitan. I am one of the co-founders here at ETR, and today we have a very, 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 very special guest. <laughs> this is a young man who I first met in Vegas many, many years ago, where I think we were both doing some Peter Overzet, aka Man's material. Uh, this young man was a part of the Broathlon, if anyone remembers that nonsense. Formerly worked with us here at ETR, undoubtedly one of the sharpest thinkers out there about fantasy football strategy. And now, and now, also one of the richest people that I know, it is, of course, Pat Kareen. Pat, how's it going, buddy? It's going good. Yeah, I think one of the, one of the first times we met, uh, you were pouring a beer all over yourself uh, trying to run, and I was filming it. So <laughs> we've both come a long way, I think. <laughs> Yeah, if you guys know me, you know, uh, over that demanded that we do this beer mile. In other words, you run a quarter mile, you drink a beer, run a quarter mile, chug a beer, run a quarter mile, chug a beer. And that's how you do it. Of course, everybody knows I don't really like drinking that much. I was just, Pat was like, had the camera in my face as I just poured the beer all <laughs> over my face and, and swallowed none of it. Anyways, anyways, no one cares. So Pat is here today because it is not often people win $2 million dollars in fantasy football. Yeah, you know, there's DFS Millie Makers every week. And yeah, there's some nosebleed stuff that is very high stakes. But $2 million in best ball is just so captivating. We just had to have him on the show. And if anyone doesn't know what I'm talking about here, best ball is simply draft only fantasy. No waivers, no trades, no setting lineups. You do a draft before the season, you play it out from there. Obviously, that format creates uh, a bit of different strategies and theories which I think we're all trying to figure out as the game kind of matures. Pat's win came in underdog's best ball mania, which was just absolutely insane this past summer. $25 buy-in, $2 million to first, $1 million to second, something like 451,000 entries, if you want some idea of how popular underdog is and how popular best ball has gotten. So anyways, Pat, take us back on your best ball journey. Where did you first hear about best ball? How much best ball... Have you played in your life prior to this? So like best ball, when I first heard about it and stuff was like mostly like the, you know, MFL 10 type of stuff where you would just draft a, a league as like a 12 team league. And then you would win the prize pool of winning a 12 team league, but you know, with no management. So you could kind of like in DFS terms, more like cash games or something where you're just trying to, you know, grind out a, a good um, profitable ROI by just playing a ton of these leagues. I never really got into that. I was just like, you know, it's, it felt sort of like uh, I never got into cash games in DFS either. So I'm kind of thinking, you know, once once like Best Ball Mania showed up a couple years ago and kind of these more top heavy prize pools, these tournament structures, that was definitely more interesting to me. Um, and I didn't really play Best Ball Mania one like I didn't max it. I, I'm not sure how many entries I had. I definitely dabbled. Uh, but, you know, then, I, you know, seeing. Justin Herzig take that down and everything. And it's, you're like, yeah, that'd be kind of, kind of nice. Like let's, you know, maybe fire at this. So I, I, uh, I maxed it last year. I think one of my drafts got voided. And so I never got my cactus, which is always, uh, which has always been a bummer, but yeah, uh, 149 official drafts last year, I think. And, uh, took it, you know, very, very seriously last year, trying to, you know, employ all the, the tactics and stuff to take down the specific format, which is a bit different than kind of, traditional best ball where you're just trying to win a 12 man league you're trying to win uh four different rounds in order to win the top money in this in this tournament yeah and i remember the mfl 10s i remember thinking this is absolutely incredible because for someone like me who is kind of uh looking for something to sharpen my draft skills prepare for the season but not deal with waivers and trades and all of that stuff um it really really appealed to me and i think that appealed to a lot of people as well, I would actually now, I mean, DFS still remains my favorite form of fantasy, but I don't think best ball is really like that far behind. I know you play everything, Dynasty, DFS, best ball. What, what's your favorite redraft? What's your favorite form of fantasy now? And try not to be colored by winning $2 million in best ball. I mean, honestly, like I think Dynasty is still kind of my favorite just because you're so in the weeds on like all of the, like you're thinking long term, you're thinking about, you know, these, these guys' careers. Um, I also think there's like big, big edges in the dynasty format because um, it's like a format that I think people want to play emotionally. Like that's sort of some of the fun of it. And so there's like some edges 
uh, that you know are maybe bigger than other formats. And also, I I enjoy it. I, there's some leagues I let myself play emo more emotionally than others because I think that's part of the fun. But best ball is obviously extremely fun just because you don't have to worry about waiver wire and stuff. And I I play in a bunch of high stakes leagues where you're grinding the waiver wire, and you know by week nine it's kind of, you're kind of like oh man kind of wish uh wasn't wasn't having to uh you know change out my kicker and everything so yeah uh there's it's it's a lot of fun I, and i like the tournament aspect to best ball it's not just underdog does it one one way a number of other sites kind of have slightly different tweaks on it so kind of yeah. thinking through the different formats is fun and the crazy thing is like there's still people out there who are probably listening to this who have never played best ball and underdog still got 451,000 entries this year like there's still room for best ball to get bigger, which is so, so, so insane to me. Anyways, anyways, let's get into it. The There is a lot of debate between macro and micro in best ball. In other words, some people go into a draft, a best ball draft, and be like, hey, these are the guys that I like better than the market. These are the guys I think that are the best for this format. I'm going to be very micro. In other words, player takes. There's other people who say all that matters is structure, right? Just let me see the ADP. Let me use ETR's rankings, and I'm going to win by having a better structural team. I, I think I come down somewhere in the middle when you were drafting how do you think about micro versus macro stuff i think both are just very important um the i i'm gonna it was either leone maybe it was eric fine someone has been saying that structure is sort of the anti to the game and i i think like that's a decent way to think about it like you kind of have to think through the fact that another way i've been trying to think of it is like if you're familiar with doing auction drafts where you know if you you might like taking an early running back, but if all the early running backs are kind of, if you're priced out of those guys and, you know, you you might have to pivot and go a different way. Or if you've spent a ton of money on a running back in the beginning of an auction draft, that might make you feel a little bit like I shouldn't probably spend a ton of my budget on an, another running back. Or, you know, you kind of want to always factor in what you've already done and think of, think of your draft picks almost like pre-allocated dollars that you're going to be spent. Like, your 18th round pick is a dollar. And honestly, so is your 14th round pick probably. And so I think thinking through like the fact that you are sort of budgeting your, your team based on, um, you know, you want to, you want to properly budget your resources, essentially. That is what structure is. Uh, and structure is going to, you know, if you, if you're in a, if you're in a year that ends up being a really good year for early round wide receivers and a really bad year for early round running backs, then, you know, zero running back type of structures are going to have a really good year. If you're not in that year, then, you know, early running back structures might have a really good year. So you think you want to be open to the idea of many different types of structures. You know, you don't, you don't just want to just kind of go all in on one. Even if you do strongly believe that there's a bigger edge in some than others, I think you need to be able to draft out of all the structures well. Uh, and then I also am a player takes guy and a big player stands guy. Like I don't have any problem going big on, you know, player you know, fades, uh, you know, going, pushing in on certain players. I do think you want to be mindful of what you're doing there. Be intentional. That's something I've, I've tried to work on a lot, like kind of checking in with myself, like, Hey, you have a pretty big stand on this guy. Is that something you actually want by the end of draft season? Same with your fade positions, just kind of thinking through it as this goes, because with best ball, like you start really early, you might be starting in May, you're drafting through the end of the summer. I think there's time to kind of have those check-in points and make sure you are where you want to be. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think the whole idea that player takes don't matter has gone way too far. Like, they, you need to have good, strong player takes. And we'll get into some of that in a second there, in a second here. But yeah, like, if you don't like Debo Samuel this year and Debo Samuel fell to you in the third round, it was just like, oh, well, he's a great deal at ADP. It doesn't mean you still have to take him. And maybe some people disagree there. That, that's just my opinion. The problem with that is, as you said, you're going to start getting your portfolio kind of out of whack. And so I think people were curious what your overall exposures looked like this year like where did you have the most leverage against the field and again pat had 150 teams the max in this 25 dollars buy-in on underdog where did you have the most leverage against the field both positively and negatively in terms of player takes this year yeah so uh rashad white was actually my highest owned uh highest exposure guy i had him on 45 percent of my teams although not this one <laughs> so uh it's funny because a lot of the players that I was like highest on were not on this particular team. Ramondre Stevenson, I had on 18%. He was one of my highest uh, owned running backs. Um, and so, you know, he was a, a feature of this team, very important part of this team. But I went pretty heavy on uh, some of the rookie running backs. I had Tyler Algier at 
Uh, as I said, White at 45. Jerick McKinnon was my second highest owned running back at 28%, um, which helped. I had like, again, he wasn't on this team, but that was obviously very helpful. But I mean, I made a ton of mistakes this year. I had Trey Lance was my highest uh, exposure quarterback, 20%. Kyler Murray, 18%. Russell Wilson, 16%. Ryan Tannehill, 12%. You got to go to Jalen Hurts at, at 12 and Patrick Mahomes at 11 before you, you see anything good there. Sky Moore was my highest owned wide receiver. Then, then Burks, 28 Moore was at 29, Burks 28, AJ Brown 26, uh, Garrett Wilson 23. Um, I would say my the biggest thing I did probably in terms of like overall leverage on the field is that uh, this this is only through 135 teams, but using the Spike Week tools, I was checking where I was at in terms of structure. I had elite tight end on 63% of my teams. Kittle was on this team. I had him on 15% of teams. I had Pitts at 17%. Um, Andrews at 13, Kelsey at 12, Waller at 12. Uh, so elite tight end was something I definitely, in terms of structure and, and all the players basically available, uh, that I did have quite a bit of leverage on. Yeah. I wanted to ask about that tight end thing. Cause I actually think that that is a huge, huge, huge part of best ball. When you have a tight end crushing and everyone else is scraping it together. I somehow was able to win the three, three, three single entry with total dust at tight end until the final week when Albert O somehow got there for me. And I think that was just more randomness and luck than anything. I, I do think elite tight end, having elite tight end in best ball, is he maybe even more valuable than redraft? Is that why you went with so many elite tight end builds on underdog? It is. Yeah. Um, I think it's really powerful in best ball. Sean Siegel's done a number of articles over the years, kind of showing consistently that it's very powerful in best ball. I did some research uh, that I published on Rotor World in the summer that was showing like you can basically superpower any build with an elite tight end. It just is, is one of the biggest edges, I think. And I think that George Kittle's run showed like kind of exactly why the edge exists. Um, he didn't do a ton for me in the regular season, but not a ton of tight ends do a ton. Yeah. So you're mostly like you're competing in your 12 team league against a lot of teams that aren't scoring many points at the tight end position. And then in this format, you know, after you finish top two in a 12 team league, that gets you to a single week elimination week 15. You have to finish first out of 10 teams. George Kittle going off in that week is extremely helpful for you to be able to get through that. And then you have to finish first out of 16 the following week. You get another strong tight end performance, which Kittle gave me. That is massive. And then he didn't have a big week 17, but I lucked out because Kelsey didn't either. You know, so there's no there's only so many uh like tight end scores you're really going against if you happen to capture one of them it's just it just propels you through these single week elimination weeks yeah the only th other thing i'd say about tight end is like yeah i was in on elite tight end this year the problem is i thought kyle pitts and mark andrews were elite tight end right and like mark andrews started off hot and totally did nothing down the stretch kyle pitts was a disaster the whole way until he got hurt and so like you need some mic you need to hit both micro and structurally but i do think that the elite tight end does make a ton of sense. Okay. This team specifically that ended up winning the 2 million is an RB RB start. I highly doubt you have very many <laughs> RB RB starts because Pat has earned a reputation as one of the zero RB spreadsheet socialists who is ruining fantasy football. Of course, <laughs> I say that in, I say that in jest because if you guys listen to us, we do uh, for the most part, believe that hero RB or zero RB is the best way to play a lot of these formats i did a lot of hero rb this year we'll get to that in a second here but do you know how many rb rb starts you had and to be clear in this draft pat picked from the seventh spot when austin eckler seventh overall and then saquon barkley in round two i assume this draft was somewhat early-ish in the process because i think saquon ended up going like end of round one early round two before july 18th everything. this this draft was july 18th okay so talk to the people about starting rb rb and how many of these you actually had yeah, so my uh, my top structure through 135 of these, uh, I probably should load in the rest and figure it out, but it was 26% hero running back, 23% uh, zero running back, and then 17% dual running back. So, you know, RB, RB. So uh, I was kind of trying out different structures as, and I would I would recommend doing that. You know, you don't, you don't want to kind of go all in on, on one structure. Uh, and I've written about... Uh, the power of these running back seasons 
I've called them the a legendary running back season where you get exactly what Austin Eckler gave us through the first 17 weeks of the season where you're scoring 23 plus PPR points per game. Uh, obviously Eckler was also quite, quite, quite valuable and half PPR as well, but just these seasons um, really do separate you from the pack in a way that even, you know, the best wide receiver seasons don't always uh, do because running back like uh, without those really outlier seasons is not all that high scoring of a position. So if you happen to have one of the guys who's just absolutely smashing, it is really valuable. And I think in best ball, uh, you don't have the chance to find running backs on waivers. You know, you 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 just have the guys you drafted, and so having even like replaceable ish, like replaceable plus running back points is more of an advantage. But in this team, I got uh, two of my target lists on the the legendary running backs this year. I had Austin Eckler as a target, and I had Saquon Barkley as a target, and I had Barkley as a target even more like at the one two turn. So to get him at the two oh six, I mean. That's a that's a start that you know even me as is a zero running back spreadsheet socialist I'm I'm totally happy with. Yeah, and, and yeah, to be clear, we can we can talk another time, and we have talked another time about Pat about exactly how to identify these types of running back, but Eckler and Barkley very clearly fit into the mix there. The key though, and we get back to structure, and as Pat said, it's the anti the, being an anti. In other words, just table stakes for understanding how to play best ball. If you start RB RB. You got to take it easy on RB from there. Pat did not take another running back until I believe it was round 10 with Ramondre Stevenson. We had some of his late round picks. He, also later, he was able to hit on Raheem Mostert on this team. You do end up a little bit thin at quarterback when you start this way, but I like these three later round QB builds. I think you had Tom Brady, Danny Dimes, and Tua, all of which kind of hit at their prices. What do you think about three later running backs versus two, I'm sorry, three later quarterbacks versus two quarterback structures. Yeah, one of the things that I was trying to think about more this summer was how some of these structures kind of all fit together. And one thing that had jumped out to me, and this is in the articles that I wrote for Rotor World, was that uh, the way running back pockets have fallen is that there's essentially been two really good times over the, the last like three or four years to draft running backs the early rounds because you get a chance for these really high upside running back seasons but those obviously come with a lot of risk to take the running backs there there's high bust rates there's a lot of opportunity cost obviously but then there's been this second pocket in kind of the the late single digit early double digit rounds where we tend to see a lot of like the zero running back candidates who add a ton of value to your team and that's at a point where wide receiver value is falling off if you're going running back running back then you don't necessarily need to hammer the running back values in that range. I took Ramondre Stevenson in the 10th round, but if I had only gone with a hero running back build where I just took one early running back, or if I had a zero running back build, I would really need to prioritize running back in those, in those rounds, having the running back running back start basically frees up a pick in the, you know, early double digit rounds. And so I, I think this build, it kind of makes a lot of sense to go, with three quarterbacks because you have that extra pick. So I took Tua in the 12th. I took Daniel Jones in the 14th. And, you know, I took uh, Mike Jasicki in the 13th, Wondell Robinson in the 15th. So from, uh, and Jacoby Myers in the 11th. So from the 10th all the way through the end of the 15th, I still only have three running backs. And then I, I took two more running backs in 16 and 17 uh, with two guys who were on the Dolphins together at the time. Uh, just kind of hoping to hit one of them was sort of thinking like I, I kind of already have running back mostly figured out. I just need to hit one more uh, and, I, and I'll be all right. But I think the the three quarterback structure probably pairs best with with a running back running back start was my feeling before the season. It's my feeling now. Uh, and it's kind of an interesting structure because it allows you to get more stacks in. I had a two a mm -hmm. stack. I had bring backs on that stack. I had a Tom Brady stack. I had a DJ Moore bring back on that stack. Uh, and I had Daniel Jones stacked with giants no bring backs there but he was stacked with saquon he was also stacked with wonder robinson you know you bring up the week 17 stuff for those guys that aren't deep in the weeds it, it almost turned into a joke this summer i mean it got so far in my opinion blown <laughs> completely out of control <laughs> people saying that that you should be drafting in a way that you have game stacks that you have correlation you know we talk in dfs about bring backs all the time double stacks with bring backs People were drafting, going out of their way to set up week 17 correlation across teams. Now, Pat did it here. It sounds like somewhat purposefully 
by having a Brady stack with DJ Moore bring back. And it actually hit because that game kind of went nuts and allowed DJ Moore to have one of his best games of the season. I thought it got overblown. I, I, and I, I believe in the merit of it. I, I thought that for most people, for 95% of people, it's enough just trying to concentrate on doing the right thing structurally and micro that adding in a layer of trying to correlate week 17 would probably mess them up more than it would help them. And like myself included, and I was doing 10 drafts at a time. So maybe I'm not a good example anyways, but I, I don't know. Did you think the week 17 stuff was overblown? It sounded like it was actually in your mind though, when you were drafting this team. I don't think it was overblown. And, you know, I think the, you know, the week 17 is all that matters video that Pete Overzet did was like the best thing uh, of the summer. I loved that video and it, it like totally did change the way I drafted. And then I did additional research um, kind of looking at, you know, kind of how to build through the week 17 uh, and, and the, the this, this overall playoff structure. What I guess I would say is like, it's not just week 17 you are trying to get a team through. You have to finish first of 10, first of 16, then first of 470. It is helpful to have some correlation there. Like I, I didn't really get into week 16 bring back so much, you know, <laughs> but if you have stacks, you know, and, and one team goes off and you, you have your quarterback carrying along other pieces, I think that is pretty helpful. But I mean, this, this team is an example of someone who is very much on board with the week 17 stuff. I had, I had George Kittle with a mini correlation with Hunter Renfro. I mean, I, I, this is a this thing is full of bits. I was doing all the week seventeen bits in here. I, I had two Patriots receivers uh, coming back as bringbacks: Tyquan Thornton and Jacoby Myers on on this Miami thing. So, uh, you know, I think you can obviously take it too far. I, what I would, guess I would say is like using it as tiebreakers. I think it, it makes a ton of sense because even though it is like a fairly big final round, four hundred and seventy teams. In terms of DFS, like if you think through like small field, medium field, like 470, I think would still be generally considered like a small field yeah. GPP. It's the type of thing you can win with something that looks a little bit gross. Like you might not need to hit the perfect team. Yeah. Even going into a single week tournament where you're just building that that morning. So to have something that you just need to get a couple things right and all of a sudden you're really live. And that's the way this team was. I knew that. It wasn't just that I had the stack, but the way it worked out is that Tom Brady to Chris Godwin to with DJ Moore coming back was very low owned. All three guys were low right. owned. So going into the day, I was like, basically, if these guys kind of if this game goes off, then then I'll start looking at this team in a serious way. Um, and I knew that I knew that was my path from the start. And I think having those those angles definitely definitely helps to some degree. Okay, I want to ask about that last round format because I think some people like it, some people don't like it where everything comes down to week 17. And honestly, like the ideal, the ideal way to win is to reach the finals with the worst possible team. And let me just try to explain that for a second. Everybody had Justin Jefferson. Everybody had Travis Kelsey. These guys were massively owned. And I know most of you guys listen to this, play DFS. You understand how hard it is to win a tournament when you're playing guys 40% owned a whole roster of guys that everybody else has. It's really hard. The way to win is to get there with Mike Evans, 2%. I know that uh, Pat didn't have that, but Mike Evans, 2%. You know, nobody had DJ Moore. I think very few people or relatively few people maybe had uh, Brady. Uh, uh, Kittle, I'm not sure how many people had. But you get my point, Pat, that getting to the final with the worst possible team is a huge, huge, huge edge. There's no way we can draft for that. There's no way we can plan for that, I don't think. So what do you think about the final finals format if you were the king of the best ball world would everything on week 17 be the way you would structure it knowing that you need to that like it's not you're not really getting rewarded for the best team all year you're getting rewarded for coming to their coming to the final with the worst possible team well thanks uh yeah no i <laughs> <laughs> um no i think that from like an entertainment value perspective the week 17 format is pretty fun like i've played in uh dynasty leagues um you know redraft leagues where it's kind of like a sprint the last you know three weeks 14 15 16 or 15 16 17 whatever will be just a total point sprint and i think this is it's kind of more fun than that where you you get one in and it's like okay now all i need is this week clean slate all i need is this week you can you can dream on it a little bit more um i think Personally, I think that's kind of fun. <laughs> I am a bit biased. Um, but I guess 
you know, I wonder if there could be like more overall money to the to the regular season or maybe like a total points that includes the playoffs as well, not just uh, weeks one through 14. I think having like more avenues towards making this like a profitable exercise would probably be good. But I do I do enjoy having, you know, this element of it where you do have to get in and then you have this team that maybe lucks into br- like bringing along a couple guys who aren't aren't all that uh, owned in the final round and uh, they become massive leverage. For sure. Did you have any other teams in the final? No, right? You just had the one team no. in the final. Do you know do you know what your advance rate was out of the out of the regular season? I advanced 30 teams uh, out of the the regular season. I advanced four teams to the semifinals and then I advanced one to uh, to the final. Got it. Uh, you mentioned this team was drafted in July. Um, I've thought about this a lot, you know, and it's kind of a push and pull. I think that I think that one of my edges would be understanding where the market is going to go and like being higher on guys before the market comes around to it. By the time it's August and September, the market has already come around to it. In other words, Saquon Barkley is already going at the end uh, of round at the end of round one by then. So that's a big edge. On the other hand, it's undoubtedly softer closer to the season. Like you see some wild stuff in those September drafts with a bunch of people that, you know, aren't listening to this Virgin podcast and everything like that. Uh, who come in and have some wild player takes. They're falling asleep during the draft. They're not grinders, whatever. So you get softer drafts, but the ADPs, I think, are mostly correct by the time September comes. We follow what I'm saying. So do you have a take on when the optimal time is to draft a best ball team? I think they all have their advantages and disadvantages as as you laid out. Um, And I think there's been kind of a push towards, uh, you know, kind of a barbell strategy where you draft a lot of your team's like some of the sharper guys will draft a lot of their teams early on where there's max uncertainty um, and you can potentially build more super teams and then draft a lot of the teams when we, when we kind of know, and maybe you're going against some softer opponents. But I guess what I would say is like, I, that didn't really work out for me to do it that way because uh, like I have a lot of content responsibilities and stuff. And I just didn't think I'd be able to get in enough teams. So I took like a little mini pause more like in the beginning of August, but I basically drafted all the way through and it had to be an advantage that all these sharp guys were just like, yeah, I'm not going to be drafting on July 18th, you know, mm-hmm. you know, so maybe, maybe I did kind of get a little bit of an edge built in as other people were thinking through when, when not to draft. I think you probably like, I, I plan to draft throughout the summer again next year. I do think you maybe want to adjust the styles of your draft. Like if you think through, okay, max uncertainty, what builds does that help? It probably helps zero running back builds more where, you're trying to leverage all of this crazy chaos that's going to come. The more chaos ahead, the more likely that maybe that benefits a team structured to benefit from chaos. And, you know, with the flip side of that, if you're trying to basically pick the right guys and, you know, build a team that is maybe like slightly more fragile, but more powerful, if you have the right players on it um, and you get a couple awesome early running back selections, like maybe, Later in the summer would be a better spot for the double the double early running back or the hero running back. Obviously, if the draft falls to you a certain way, go with it. But I think like in general, kind of just like dialing things up and down throughout the summer probably makes sense. All right. Let's get to the ending here. So for those guys who weren't following along, going into the Monday night game against the bit between the Bills. And the Bengals, Pat was in first, and he had a pretty sizable lead in first. A lot of people, I'm sure including Pat himself, were trying to figure out the equity, the chances. Uh, From what we gathered, and I believe from what Pat gathered, Pat had around a 25% chance of winning. Now, he was a favorite against each individual team. I think clearly against all the teams that were coming for him, though, he was a dog. In other words, 25% equity. I think Leone uh, or you or someone figured out, you know, something around 767K equity on the team because there was of course a million dollars to second and other things now game happens horrible thing happens to damar hamlin a lot uh game was canceled per the rules obviously uh game gets canceled standing to end how they are maybe you can take the people through your thoughts around all that and how you felt uh in the time we didn't know if the game would be replayed etc etc yeah, so we were we were live on ship chasing as um, 
you know, DeMar's in, as DeMar was injured and just in real time trying to absorb how serious it was. Uh, and so, yeah, we, we signed off there. And at that point, it's like, I mean, it just does remind, like all this stuff is like so meaningless compared to his health. And, and that, that situation was so horrible. Um, and then it, you know, there's this thing of like, in the back of your mind, like, okay, like if this game isn't replayed in the, as, as the days are going on, like, I, I assume that will mean I, the, the standings will hold. And, but at the same time, like, I kind of felt like it would be replayed. Um, and yeah, so it was just like this, this total uncertainty, but also like, just like sort of remind myself, like also like, just, just, just let DeMar be all right. And then like the rest, then we'll figure out the rest, you know, like that's kind of where my head was at. And to get the, the really positive news that we had on Thursday, uh, which was like right, like kind of before stuff started to kind of more, maybe not like officially yet, but like semi-officially come out that the game wasn't being played. That was so massive. And it allowed me to kind of absorb the information about the game and like, you know, think through that, like, okay, now, this means that maybe I am going to win best ball mania three and then trying to figure out, okay, what does that mean? That's like, I need to like hire an accountant and, you know, <laughs> figure out like all this logistical stuff that I have to also figure out. Like I have to be like telling people like, Oh, and by the way, like I also might not really win any money here. So this all might be totally a moot point, but I kind of had to start thinking through some of that um, just ahead of time. Uh, my girlfriend's like, don't get ahead of yourself. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not actually getting ahead of myself. I don't think I'm like <laughs> planning for like a contingency or something, you know? Um, I'd say two things. Uh, best ball, like the whole thing of it, like the whole reason that I actually really love it is because you're detached from the results. Right. And it's like, it's kind of how I try to live my life, make the best decision possible. And then everything else is out of your control. Pat was not in control of what happened to DeMar, if the game would be rescheduled or how, how underdog would handle it or, or all that. So like, it's kind of within the theme of best ball. And then to hit the parlay, Pat, I mean, I, I joke a lot, man, but for DeMar Hamlin to be okay and for you to win, I mean, my God, an all time life parlay. So yeah, I, I mean, just absolutely, absolutely, absolutely incredible. I know people want to say, how do you feel winning 2 million? What are you going to spend it on? Are you going to spend it on hookers and cocaine or just hookers? <laughs> <laughs> or or what is your what is your plan and how does it feel to have the two million? I assume that you have uh, already withdrawn it from your account, or maybe you haven't. I don't know. I'm work, I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was on news show. I'm I'm uh, still blurbing, still blurbing. So you know, the, <laughs> the in between blurbs, I'm trying to get the money up. Uh, but yeah, you know, uh, they did double pr the prize pool from last year. So I believe uh, I believe Liam just went with the hookers last last year, but, but <laughs> that's a little extra. <laughs> um, no, I uh, I think that like in terms of of like the money and stuff, like this is my living room. Uh, I do not have an office uh, that has created some some minor inconveniences <laughs> over the years of working uh, and podcasting out of out of a living room uh, that I share with my girlfriend. So. Uh, that'll be uh, definitely something we're going to be looking to to correct. Get an office for me. Nice. Um, that that's like kind of the the top thing at the moment. But yeah, it's uh, yeah the whole thing's crazy. Okay, I asked for some questions on the Twitter machine. Got a bunch of good ones here. I got about a six. I'm going to ask you quickly here. Question one from Chris. He says, when faced with tough draft choices, how do you balance your gut picks versus who the data is telling you? To draft, I'm not sure exactly what data he's referring to here. I assume he he assumes some kind of rankings, but I assume that you are IKBing rankings at some point, and also trying to keep a balanced portfolio. You don't want 100 of a guy over 150 teams because then you're just uh, over leveraging yourself, even if you want to have a take on a guy. So, anyways, how do you balance the gut stuff versus what I presume Chris means your rankings? So I draft I drafted almost all of these teams on my phone and like primarily off of like gut. I guess when I was drafting, but then trying to check back in on my exposures on rankings, you know, making sure like talking through stuff. Uh, I'm like in a privileged position where I get to like do content where I'm like basically having these conversations. Like, what do you think about this guy here? And kind of refining my opinions. But um, 
then kind of so sort of updating my gut feel a lot and then drafting for fun. I mean, I think these drafts are fun. Like I right. want them to be fun. So um, I'm not, I don't have like a, you know, a terminal set up where the data is spitting out, like draft this guy, draft that guy. It's, it's more based off feel. And then I had all the week 17 stuff memorized, you know, so I'm trying, <laughs> I'm trying to Davis, <laughs> Davis Maddock had the idea of once you draft, a team once you draft a player from a team you star all of the players from that team and then the team that they're facing so you kind of have it in your head you do do get into some trouble there if you don't draft quick enough you might end up with a terrible selection from someone that you start but uh yeah that that's about as far as like i got into you know kind of uh any any process uh around the draft it was more um still kind of drafting pretty traditionally yeah, and, and I, to be clear on Pat, I assume that you're still uploading rankings, right? You're not just going off straight when you say you're no, drafting ADP. from your phone. Wow, ADP. straight ADP. I go off ADP. Like I've never had any issues, like knowing who I want to draft. You know what I mean? If anything, I'm sort of being like I have to like push myself away from just dra- like this is my only Tyquan Thornton team, the team that won, mm-hmm. and that would be another reason, by the way. I think the correlation stuff is cool, is because like I don't draft Tyquan Thornton if I don't have Dolphins and if I don't have other Patriots. I did that specifically because of the correlation and the stacking elements, and it helps me diversify. I'm someone that probably needs that help diversifying. And so for me, the ADP is another way of helping me diversify because I will take some ADP values. You know, Tyler Lockett was on this team. I didn't love Tyler Lockett, but he's a good wide receiver and he was going very, very cheaply. So taking some of those ADP values, I think, is helpful. And uh, particularly for the way I tend to draft where I, I, have no problem, you know, being overweight on certain players, taking stances, et cetera. Along those lines of Taekwon Thornton, Nick asked in the late rounds of best ball, does anything really matter? Serious question. Uh, on this team, your last five picks, I believe, were Daniel Jones, Wandell Robinson, Raheem Mostert, Sony Michelle, Taekwon Thornton. I- I'm not trying to necessarily follow Nick's question here. Does anything really matter? I mean, of course it matters, but what do you think about late round? Yeah, I think with the the late round picks, and I looked at uh, Liam Murphy's winning team last year. And one thing that jumped out to me about his team is that his late round selections were massive for him and getting through the single elimination weeks, right? So maybe your early round picks are carrying a lot more weight for you to get through your 12 team league, but you are very likely going to need some spike weeks out of your late round picks in order to take the whole thing down. And my late round pick, actually, as I was looking at my team heading into Sunday, I wasn't all that confident partly because I didn't think my late round picks were very good. You know, like well, Wando Robinson's out for the year. Um, Sony Michelle was obviously not going to do anything for me. So it's like, am I going to get enough out of Raheem Mostert and Taekwon Thornton? Because I'm probably going to need stuff like that. I'm not going to run pure enough with my early round picks. Mm-hmm. And I got really lucky that Taekwon Thornton scored a touchdown, almost scored a second touchdown. Raheem Mostert had a huge day on a, on a week where Saquon Barkley doesn't really do much. So that ends up being like a massive leverage point for me where Barkley was a guy who got me there, ends up being chalky in the final week, doesn't do anything. And one of my late round picks comes through with a score that hits my final lineup. So I think you do want to think through these late round picks carefully and think through that, think through them with the mindset of these are the guys who might be able to give me spike weeks, week 15, 16, and 17. Next question is from Brandon. He says, can you rank the order of importance of these while you're drafting? One, team correlations. Two, optimizing playoff matchups. Three, positional amounts. Thanks and congrats. One one thing that I would say is that while I, you know, thought maybe the week 17 bring back stuff was overrated, what I didn't think was overrated was understanding week 17 matchups. In other words, like a dome game between two bad defenses or two really good offenses is obviously way better than having some outdoor game. And it turned out to be weather in week 17 was fine. But like you saw in week 16, it was a freaking mess out there and so I, I i don't know did you look at uh week 17 environments because yeah i don't think we know exactly how good defenses are going to be or exactly how good offenses are going to be there's gonna be all kinds of surprise but you can have a pretty good guess that like bill's Bengals is probably going to be a matchup of two good offenses in week 17 so what do you think about that and then what do you think about uh um brendan's question here yeah i mean i think stacking up those games i mean i i had a lot of bill's Bengals. i think stacking up bill's Bengals is really sharp um i think you know, I had a lot of Chiefs Broncos, which wasn't wasn't as sharp as it turns out. But, uh, you know, I think that makes a ton of sense to attack those matchups that you think are going to be really high scoring in the final week. 
but not not only doing that you know like maybe there's maybe you know it could be the case that the team you get in is has a lot of stacks of teams that aren't or games that aren't as likely to uh, go off but they're probably going to be games that people not only have less of those players but less of those types of stacks because they're less appealing you know mm-hmm. no one no one wanted to stack up uh, you know the the dolphins the the Patriots, like those aren't appealing games to stack up uh, this past summer. And there's going to be plenty of games like that going into next year. So I think you still want to think through it, not just to targeting the, the most fun games, but obviously like you want to be overweight, the games that you think are going to go off. I, th- I think that's, that's just kind of logical. And then in terms of like how many players at each position and stuff, I do think like fundamentally like a well-structured team is, is the best thing you can do uh because like you if you don't budget your team well your odds of getting through the first round are so much lower your odds of you know having the right guys and the right weeks are going to be lower as well so i think just got that's sort of the foundational level stuff of of just uh structure and understanding how all this works together from d millie says what's the research you'd recommend for tax purposes slash tax tax brackets and how to even begin the process of winning something this Big, yes. Well, I can speak for Pat by saying that our friends at the United States government are very happy with Pat's win because they will be roughly sharing (laughs) in half of his proceeds. He happens to live in the state of New York and in New York City. And so don't you worry. The government is very much here happy (laughs) with our friend Pat because they know he's going to be good and pay his taxes. But yeah, I I, I don't know if there's really any answer here. Pat, sounds like you're just getting your head around what's going to happen here on that front. Well, you can tell that I'm not uh, BSing when I said I didn't think I was gonna gonna take down this tournament because if I did, I would have moved to uh, Florida or Texas yeah. or something and not not lived in Brooklyn as as the money <laughs> came in. <laughs> uh, I'm still figuring that out, but I think uh, taxes taxes is going to be a big part of my life uh, going forward uh, for this year. It sounds like I was actually uh, talking to some people in between when the delay was happening, and I was like, "Man, he should." establish residency in florida in the next four days but you know that would have been an alpha move and probably under a lot of scrutiny so probably for the best i I don't know i don't know how all of the details of that work but it did seem a little bit tough for me to oh it's funny you wanted to move to florida on uh january (laughs) mid-january that's an interesting time (laughs) uh question from tommy he says how slash when did pat break the news to his parents how slash when did pat break the news to his parents so i i wait so i didn't even tell my parents that we have like a family call on sunday that i couldn't make uh legitimately it was like i really can't make this because it's like at five o'clock or something and i was i was blurbing of my one o'clock game so i had to you know i was, I was working so i was like i don't think i'm gonna be able to make it but then as that um was all happening we're talking about me being at like in like 10th or 11th and then like probably during that call jumping up into second and so like the sweat really really kind of starting to kick in and i did not let them know about any of that i figured you know i'll know pretty soon if this is like a real sweat and then i had to get through the sunday night game i did not have any players left in the sunday night game there were several very good teams right behind me with multiple players one team had isaiah likely uh, almost got there, almost passed me with Isaiah Likely. He also had George Pickens, Pat Fryermuth. So um, getting through the Sunday night game was like no given at all. And then at, I got through the Sunday night game. Then it came down to the Monday night game. It's like, why would I put my parents through this? <laughs> you know, like, let me, because if I, if I finish 11th, which pays out 10K in this tournament, and I tell them, hey, I won 10K playing fantasy, they're going to be psyched, mm-hmm. you know? So let's, and that, and I probably will need that energy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so let me let me just wait. Let me just wait and tell them. And then, when, you know, when everything was happening, the game is suspended, and and all the uncertainty around Demar Hamlin, I was like, I'm definitely not putting them through this either. So I waited until uh, Thursday. Uh, I called my dad and my my grand my um, my mom was down at my grandmother's, uh, so they weren't together. So I called my dad, and he'd been kind of trying to catch up with me since sunday and so i i talked to him he was obviously very psyched we had a nice conversation and then we like caught up about all the stuff he like wanted to talk to me about anyway like very, very kind of mundane regular stuff and that was actually r- really nice just to kind of have a normal conversation to tag the 
the conversation about me winning. Um, and then I called my mom once we had like some additional confirmation that the game was, was not going to be played. Um, and I basically had to convince her. She like fully didn't believe that this had happened. <laughs> yeah. I don't actually tell my parents anything because anytime I win something, their first response is, yeah, but how much did you lose? And I just can't face that. And so I just don't, I just don't even, I just don't even bother. So shout out to you and shout out to your parents. <laughs> All right. Last question we're going to do here today before we get Pat out of here is from Matt. He says, how did Pat's now ex-girlfriend take the news? And I, you know, I'm sure Matt is joking. You hear it all the time. You know, guys are in medical school. They become a doctor. They move on to the next girl. How did your now ex-girlfriend take the news here, Pat? <laughs> Not ex-girlfriend. She is uh, my current <laughs> girlfriend still. <laughs> she took it. Well, so she was looped in. So she kind of went through the same up and down uh, roller coaster and everything. And uh, I feel like she she definitely handled it really well and she kind of got up to speed i was impressed with how quickly she got up to speed entering the sunday night game with with like what was going on because i've tried to explain this stuff to her before where i you know i was in the red like the red zone as a dfs tournament on DraftKings, and i would i had i don't know i was like in fifth or something one week and i was like oh my god like i might take this down and then you know you finish like 35th or whatever mm -hmm. and then you have to explain like you yeah, well, what I was saying was true, but also I've essentially won no money. <laughs> so having to like explain, like, look, it's a very top heavy payout structure. You know, if we if certain things happen tonight, then it, it changes a lot. But there's a good chance that those things don't happen. And so it's worth kind of getting excited that, you know, maybe I could actually win this tournament. Um, and she kind of got up to speed with that probabilistic thinking pretty quickly, I think. So I was I was impressed with that. Good. Can't wait to meet her. I, I, um, I, before we get out of here, I did have one more question come to mind. I, I've thought a lot about hedging in some of these spots. Like I had a couple spots and on much, much, much smaller scale with my best ball team. And I was like, Hmm, like I should really probably be hedging here. If I can find like a neutral EV bet in a way to hedge, there's not really a clean way to do it because of a limits. But even if there weren't limits, there's not like fantasy point over unders. DraftKings used to have fantasy point over unders, but I don't think they do anymore but anyways uh, did it cross your mind to find a way to hedge i don't know maybe just like a, if a clean under in bill in bills Bengals or something like that uh, but you know you could still lose both there so i don't know i don't think i would have done that but yeah did it ever cross your mind in any hedging scenarios yeah it did i i went and i was like trying to put like some single game parlay stuff together for t higgins because he was like the the most teams you know had him but then it's like you know there were teams that had um Joe Mixon, Tyler Boyd, Gabriel Davis, like there's lots and lots of ways that uh, I could have fallen out of first if, you know, different combinations of guys went off. So it just like became this thing of like, man, if I, you know, fall to, you know, 11th place and then I also have to pay out this, right. <laughs> this T Higgins thing. It just, um, I didn't end up doing it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think there's really a clean way to do it. And again, yeah, like Pat said, losing both sides is just nightmare, nightmare, nightmare scenario. All right. So thanks so much to Pat for his time. I know he's a very busy man taking swan dives into gold coins these days. And so we appreciate his time here on this Monday afternoon. Pat, tell the people where they can find you on the Twitter machine if they uh, desire to do so. Yeah, I'm at Pat Corain uh, on Twitter. At Pat Corain on Twitter. All right. For the newly minted millionaire Pat, for producer Luke, I'm Adam. Good luck everybody.